We were at the Jupiter Hasir chapter 16 when we stopped last time. We stopped at the extremely important and interesting part of the Tripura Rahasya. And because this is really very important for all students of meditation to understand, I want to repeat a little bit of it. And that is this part about really how to attain a one-pointed mind and how to attain the highest. So... I will read once again verses 36 onwards from chapter 16. First, withdraw the mind from the objects of charms and temptations. Second, lead it to the goal of life. When the mind is voluntarily and completely withdrawn from the charms and temptations of the world, it remains unaffected. It is important to have mastery over the dual tendency of the mind. To comment on this, the mind has dual tendency. There are two parts of understanding this process of how the mind functions and how we can attain higher states of consciousness. So the first step is to withdraw the mind from the objects of charms and temptations, which means that before you can concentrate on your object of meditation, first you have to prevent the mind from being distracted and flowing outward. So the first step is to withdraw the mind from the external world and then lead it to the goal of life. The goal of life being Enlightenment being different words for it. Some would say Turiya, others say enlightenment, some say Samadhi, some say Kevalya, liberation, Nirvana. Different words for the same thing. It doesn't matter what you call it, but the goal of life is to attain freedom from suffering and this is achieved through deep concentration, through all the layers of mind to the center of consciousness. And in order to do that, first step is to let the mind flow inward so that it does not keep flowing outward and dissipating its energy. Once you understand this dual process, you begin to understand the very first step is not to just try to concentrate on some object, whether it may be um, a mantra or your breath or whatever object given to you by your teacher. In fact, there is a step earlier, a step that precedes this, and that step is preparation. Preparing the mind, gradually moving it out of all these external distractions and train the mind and only then lead it to the goal of life. What happens on the other hand, most frequently, is that people skip step one, they go to step two immediately, trying to concentrate on some object and then failing and getting very frustrated and saying, this is far too difficult, I don't know how to do this. There are some people, these lucky ones, these privileged ones, they can do it, but I can't. Getting frustrated and then giving up. And that's, that's unfortunate. And the way out of that is first learning to prepare yourself, prepare the mind. Any questions? Are there any comments about this dual process? Or perhaps I'll just continue to read a little bit and that can be discussed a little bit later after a couple of more verses. Verse 38. The perception, perception of all external objects is influenced by our conceptions of time, space and causation. 
The experience of them is possible through this twofold mental operation. But consciousness itself is unlimited. Therefore, the mind's twofold operation does not apply. Consciousness can be realized simply by withdrawing the mind from all objects. If he wants to see the image of a certain object in the mirror, he must turn his attention away from other objects images and one-pointedly fix his mind on the particular image he wants to see. If a, mind, if a man wants to see space in the mirror, he should remove the objects that create images in the mirror. The all-pervading void also exists in the mirror, but without removing the images one cannot see it. Space is everywhere. It is the foundation of all. Therefore, when all objects are taken away, Image-free space is clearly seen in the mirror. Similarly, consciousness is all-pervading and the foundation of all. O Brahman, like space, it is ever-present in the mind. Thus, for self-realization, one simply has to withdraw the mind from all objects. O Brahman, can you find a place where consciousness is not present? So, a very interesting discovery we make now is that this two-step process it works in all aspects when you want to succeed in any task that you have set yourself for your mind. Interestingly, for self-realization, to attain Atman, the most important thing is not the second step, applying the mind to focus it on a mantra or any internal object, but in fact, the first step, because when you have withdrawn your mind from external objects, the mind goes naturally internal, it internalizes and it tends to contemplate naturally and spontaneously. And since Brahman is everywhere, consciousness is everywhere, when there, is, there are no images disturbing you in the mind, what is there? What's left? It's like a TV screen or a, a film screen. Or when you go to, to the movies and you see the big screen there, it's blank first when you enter. But when the screen, you see the screen itself. But when the film starts playing, you don't see the screen anymore. You see the objects which are reflected on it. You see the movie. You forget about the screen. When the movie stops, you notice the screen. And that's exactly what happens in the mind. We have all these images. You go into meditation, you, you, you see all these images. And when these distractions also subside, within the mind itself, what will come forward? Pure consciousness, because that is the screen itself. All these objects are playing out on the screen called self or the screen called pure consciousness. You don't need to concentrate on the screen anymore because the moment the film stops, the screen becomes visible. Similarly, the moment the thoughts subside in the mind because there are no more distractions and you have learned to let go of those external distractions, not only in the external sense that you close your eyes, but in the internal sense that these things don't distract you. The moment that happens, you begin to see the foundation of all these thoughts, images, emotions that are playing out on this itself. Does that make sense? I hope uh, that was useful. Are there any questions about this? Please remember this is very important. It's very important for all those who are sincerely seeking self-realization, 
however you want to put it, enlightenment, moksha, kaivalya, liberation, freedom, however you choose to call it. There is no place where consciousness is not present. Therefore, this diversity is the creation of the mind and its modifications. Realization of consciousness requires absolute purity and not mere concentration of mind. That is why the self is called unknowable. It is not subject matter and therefore the mind cannot know it. The impurity of the mind lies in the thinking process. If the mind is free from thoughts, it becomes pure. Now it should be clear to you that purity of mind is important for realizing the self. The self can never be realized without a pure mind. Once again, very important to understand this. What is purity? Purity is a state where the thinking process itself ceases where there are no longer any distractions. The mind is free of thoughts, emotions, and that may not be over a longer period of time because these may re-emerge, but even for a short while, if they would subside, what will surface is the screen, the canvas on which all these thoughts and desires, emotions, images are being painted all the time. The canvas of pure consciousness. And that's purity. So when the mind is free from thoughts, it becomes pure. And when it's pure, you attain self-realization. So purification basically means learning to let go of all thoughts, emotions, desires and allowing these to subside. It may happen in one session and of course over a period of time as well. That would become... That process of purification when it has been strengthened over a period of time. These kind of insights or glimpses would happen more often. They increase in frequency until eventually you remain established in self-realization. Any thoughts about this? Anything you would like to to ask about the process of purification. How can one have knowledge unless the mind is purified? The mind is pure. Why cannot one attain knowledge? All spiritual means are meant for the purification of the mind. The austerities of selfless action, selfless devotion, the practice of known attachment are performed for the sole purpose of purifying the mind. Otherwise, they do not serve any purpose. The Lord of life is seen in the purified mind. For those of you who are familiar with the Yoga Sutras, uh, especially the Yamas and Niyamas, you know uh, that the first Niyama is Saucha, the Saucha and Santosha. And this is really what we are talking about. Saucha, cleanliness, purity, it's not referring merely to bodily purity or external cleanliness 
it is referring to the purity of the mind. And while things like selfless action, selfless devotion is very useful, what is really important is practice of non-attachment. That is not getting attached to thoughts and when you don't get attached to thoughts, these will subside. They simply flow away and they're gone. And when the mind is in that nature of flowing, it's, everything calms down and the Lord of life is seen. Lord of life is pure consciousness. So, you know the yamas and the niyamas? The yamas prepare us in the external sense and in mental sense, prepare us for higher practices. And higher practices, the niyamas itself, start with purification. And when we have achieved or attained a certain degree of purification, we have also greater contentment, santosha. All this has now been explained by King Janaka to Ashtavakra. Ashtavakra is a Brahmin, but he is a scholar. He likes to argue and discuss and debate. King Janaka is a king. He is a warrior. Why is it that a warrior is teaching a Brahmin the custodian of knowledge? It's nice to be a custodian of knowledge, but knowledge, or as in book knowledge itself, will not free us. So the Shiv Sutras say, Janam Bandha, Sutra 1.2, Janam Bandha means knowledge binds. Book knowledge, intellectual knowledge, knowledge without experience binds. It's merely book learning, just reading, studying. This is not true knowledge. True knowledge that frees you is knowledge that burns the ego, that is purifying knowledge. That is quite different. And who can attain that? One who acts, the one who is acting, fighting the battle of life, the battle, the internal battle. Fighting courageously. This is a warrior. The warrior itself is a symbol of one who fights against the evil. And the evil is all sorts of thoughts which disturb us all the time. So it had to be that a warrior is teaching a person who has got book knowledge. And a king is a symbol of one who has really attained mastery, a warrior who is so accomplished. He is a king now, he also looks after others. That's what a king does. In those days, when the kings had power, unlike the kings today that are more, more decorative, just figureheads, the kings in those days were a symbol of those who are not merely wealthy, but power in the sense of looking after others. You can only take care of others when you have mastery over your own self. Then you become a guardian and you help also others to develop, to grow. Welfare work which is done by people without having mastery over the self it's also good karma, but it is quite different from that of a great master, a king, like King Janaka. Hearing this from King Janaka, Ashtavakra inquired further, O king, you said that if the mind is purified by the absence of thought, pure consciousness manifests itself then it follows that sleep can bring about self-realization and one does not need to make any effort. 
Hearing the confusion of Ashtavak, <laughs> King Janaka said, Now I will resolve your doubt. Please hear me attentively. This is an interesting question because this is not the first time somebody has asked me also this question. Naturally, the mind likes to find easy ways of doing this. You know, we all want to have something like, uh, you know, instant enlightenment. Or wouldn't that be really cool if you could just go to bed and be enlightenment and wouldn't have to make any effort? That would be great, but that's not possible. Because Ashtavakta's question is, if you just talk about absence of thought then in deep sleep there is no thought. So are we enlightened then in deep sleep? Interesting to hear what King Janaka has to say. King Janaka says, It is true that in deep sleep the mind is turned away from the charms and temptations of the world, but at the same time the mind is completely veiled by tamas. How can one experience the Absolute in such a condition? If the mirror is painted black, nothing can reflect on it. Similarly, when the mind is veiled by the inertia of sleep, it is not able to respond to any illumination. It is like an eclipse of the moon. Likewise, a lump of clay on a wall could experience consciousness. Otherwise, a lump of clay or a wall could experience consciousness. Therefore, only a transparent sattvic mind can realize consciousness. Now that makes perfect sense. If it's just being thoughtless, a wall or a lump of clay is also thoughtless. But of course, a lump of clay is not enlightened. So, why is that? Because this is very tamasic. This kind of consciousness is tamasic. It's veiled. So those of us who are aware of this, you know, at every we, we've talked about this before, the, the three levels of consciousness being waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. In waking consciousness, we are, uh, we are alert. We have a different kind of consciousness. In sleep, or rather dreaming, we are not quite aware. Sometimes we may remember fragments of a dream. But a couple of dreams, perhaps, when you sleep for eight hours, and so out of these eight hours, you may have dreamt for like five to six hours, or maybe not, four, four to five hours. And still you remember just a dream or two, if at all. That's really a very small fragment. So... we don't have that same kind of awareness that we have in the waking state. And in deep sleep, even less. We're completely unaware of deep sleep, a state in which there's nothing. It's just black, stark, thoughtless. How should that be? And what is there in that deep sleep? In that deep sleep is, in fact, the self. But we do not see it simply because we are asleep. We, you can think of it like a veil, a, a dark veil, which is covering the pure consciousness in the deep sleep state. And if you would have that sattvic awareness, that same awareness that you have now as you're listening to me, if you would have that kind of awareness in deep sleep, then you would experience pure consciousness. This may be a little confusing for you if you have not had this experience. I'm sure some of you are wondering, hmm, how is it possible to experience deep sleep with awareness? Well, then I wouldn't be asleep, right? But that is possible. And that state is called Yoga Nidra. This is not to be confused with the technique called Yoga Nidra. There are many techniques called Yoga Nidra. Some of you have heard of these. Some of these are purely just visualization techniques and have absolutely nothing to do with the state of Yoga Nidra. 
then there are certain techniques that can lead to the state of yoga nidra. Depending on the technique, it can lead to the state of yoga nidra. Well, on the other hand, I, I think that the visualization techniques maybe are good for stress management, but they are not going to lead you to yoga nidra for the simple reason that itself is a state without images. And so how can the images lead to state without images? You're creating images there. You are in fact taking yourself away from yoga nidra. So that's not very um, logical. So the idea of doing visualization practices may be useful for relaxation purposes, but it will not lead to the state of yoga nidra. Question uh, from Suravi. Does yoga nidra state happen spontaneously sometimes? Yes, indeed, it does. It can happen spontaneously. When you are in deep sleep, you suddenly become aware of, aware of that and you, you, you're aware. And it may not last very long, maybe just for a few moments. But if you are really aware, you will never forget it. You will never, ever forget that. Because it is an amazing experience. The chances of yoga nidra happening spontaneously are much higher when you do practice regular meditation as taught by us, systematic meditation that leads from gross to subtle. And when you do that on a regular basis, that means daily, the chances are very high that you can spontaneously experience the state of yoga nidra. Yoga Nidra is also described sometimes like two people, two students sitting in front of an enlightened master. One is asleep and one is awake. So the one who is asleep, that's Yoga Nidra, and the one who is awake, that's Samadhi. So Yoga Nidra can be experienced in the sense that you are going down into deep sleep, but with a certain waking awareness. And in samadhi, the state of the self itself comes forward into waking state. And that's the difference. Samadhi happens in waking consciousness. And yoga nidra takes place in deep sleep, but with awareness. So King Janaka continues to explain. This is why an infant does not experience reality. The black color painted on the mirror is reflected in the mirror, but it does not show. Similarly, the intrinsic nature of the mirror to reflect whatever is in front of it cannot be altered because the mirror cannot lose its intrinsic nature. Yet, because of the black paint, it is not seen. So now imagine a mirror and you see your own reflection and now you proceed to paint the mirror black. Now, you can't see yourself anymore. But is the mirror reflecting? Yes, indeed. The mirror continues to reflect. Only it is reflecting the black paint. So you cannot see it. But because it's black, you cannot see it. And that's what's happening in deep sleep. You can't see it. Because of the lack of clarity, the lack of awareness. So likewise, in deep sleep, the mind is veiled by slumber. Therefore, for lack of clarity, it does not shine forward. The person who is awake remembers the sleeping state. In that state of mind, one can recollect the experiences of the sleeping state. I will explain this clearly. Listen attentively. 
there are two states of mind. The first is the state of illumination, the second the state of deliberation. The inner state of illumination is experienced when one contacts external objects. And the state of deliberation occurs when the objects are seen. State of illumination is nirvikalp because one is not aware of the objects. When he becomes aware of the objects, that state of mind is called sarvikalp. Experiencing something without feeling distinctions of this and that is a state of illumination. When a verbal distinction is made such as this is this, then that state is the lower state of samadhi with seed. This drama has two aspects. In this drama, what is seen is called direct knowledge. That which is based on logic is called remembered knowledge. The first category of knowledge is to realize the samskaras of the past. So, just shortly to distinguish between nirvikalp and savikalp, in nirvikalp there is no seed and in savikalp there is seed. Seed means an object. So you have seed, samadhi with seed and seedless samadhi. So samadhi and seed is when you focus your mind on a particular object and you attain samadhi. And the object may be external or internal. Generally external objects are more difficult. Sorry, internal objects are more difficult and subtler. And external objects being gross, most people find it more difficult to focus on these. But... They do not have the capacity to lead you immediately, internally, because they are external. Then the distinguished, this also distinguishes between direct knowledge and remembered knowledge. Direct knowledge is simply when you have the experience of samadhi. And remembered knowledge is when you discuss something that you may have read out of a book and usurped it, usurped it, claimed ownership of it. I have had this experience often that there are students who read a lot and there's nothing wrong in general about reading books, about um, scriptures, about these things. We are doing that ourselves right now. But when you have not experienced it, but act like you have, just because you have read something about it, that is taking ownership of something that doesn't really belong to you. And that is not useful. That is when that knowledge will bind you. That kind of knowledge, which is remembered knowledge, will bind you. So in the Vedas, we talk about Shruti, and Shruti is direct knowledge, and Smriti is remembered knowledge. What we want is not Smriti. It's good, Smriti is useful, remembered knowledge, books, all these things, websites, films, uh, all this knowledge has really helped make our life more comfortable. We are able to use these amazing systems Technology today, all the wonderful um, social media, uh, mobile technology that connects us and makes all this available to us is all because of remembered knowledge. This knowledge has developed over hundreds of years. All this, for example, would not have been possible without mathematics, without the development of the numbers, zero etc. So this knowledge didn't happen overnight. It came down over hundreds and even thousands of years till we could reach this stage where we developed this amazing technologies like internet, mobile technology, etc. So these are very useful. But that's not the same as the direct knowledge. So once again we talk about Paravidya and Aparavidya, direct knowledge, remembered knowledge, smriti, shruti. Different words, 
What is meant is the same. So in the first category, that is in direct knowledge, the aim is to realize the samskaras of the past. It means you look at your own samskaras and purify your mind of these. These are all colorings. For those of you who have attended the Yoga Sutra sessions, if you haven't, they are on, on our channel, That First English, which is on YouTube. And you can go through these. There are different versions of the Yoga Sutras. There's the Essential Yoga Sutras as well as the Complete Yoga Sutras. And it talks about the coloring of the samskaras and how one can uncolor them. In deep sleep, illumination without desire exists and lasts as long as one sleeps. This term Jada Samadhi in the scriptures. In the waking state, self-illumination seems to be diminished. Yet realization of that light is considered to be a state of Savikab Samadhi. In deep sleep is undifferentiated consciousness experience, but it is completely veiled by inertia. Therefore, it is a stupefied state. It is full of light but sheds its light on other objects and is unable to illuminate itself. This is why the learned ones have used the simile, deep sleep is like an oil lamp. The limitation imposed upon the self at the beginning of manifestation may be considered to be similar to deep sleep. It is also called avyakta, unmanifest, and mahashunya, the great void. So, this experience of yoga nidra or samadhi that one ex can experience in deep sleep if one has a little bit of awareness is also called jata samadhi. So I said basically it is the same as samadhi only the samadhi you experience in waking state would be called sarvikalp with object or nirvikalp without object but when you experience that samadhi in deep sleep is called also Jada Samadhi. And Jada means gross or dark. Jada means immovable. It, it signifies heavy, tamasic. When you say somebody is Jada, means he's heavy. You know, he's... Uh, um, dull. Dull is a good word, yes. He's dull. So that kind of Samadhi is not full of light. It's veiled. It's, it, you got inertia. Inertia is a nice word also for jada. It's a stupefied state. So this light is covered, like the example given, like that of a mirror that has been painted black. It would reflect and it would be wonderful, but only it's been painted black. So the state of deep sleep is experience of nothingness. In the waking state, the state of mind remains the same as in deep sleep, although the objects are visible. But during the waking state, a new thought arises every moment. So the world of thoughts previously experienced disappears. To go back to the earlier paragraph just quickly, it ex defines, uh, it's also calling deep sleep or the experience in deep sleep to be the great void, Maha Shunya. For some of you, it might be interesting to know that the Buddhist school or Buddha Dharma often talks about Shunya or <clears throat> the great void and, and talks about, oh, there's no self, there's no God, there's nothing, there's just a void. So Yes, it's a void, but that void is not empty. It's full, it's full of joy. But if it's veiled and you experience only in deep sleep, then it appears to be a void. But if you experience it in waking state, as in samadhi, especially nirvikalp samadhi, then it is not just an empty void. It's full. It's full of joy. It's full of love. 
It's a wonderful, vibrant state. So this state of deep sleep or nothingness means that there are no thoughts. These thoughts and everything are in seed form. They have gone back to the samskara itself, which is a seed. In the dreaming, it comes out, the seed germinates, so to say, plays itself out <clears throat> in the dream state and then slowly comes out and plays itself out in the waking state. Think of it as the magic lamp, Aladdin's lamp. Many of you have heard that story from the Arabian Nights. And you know, when you rub the lamp, a jinn, jinni would come out and make all your desires come true. Most of you may have read that story in your childhood or it was read to you. And you may have seen some pictures or illustrations of that. And mostly these are of a big golden lamp, very kind of old-fashioned looking brass lamp. And out of that is this sort of ghostly um, image coming out, uh, dressed in a very Arabian kind of outfit with a turban, right? And, and this is a little bit what your deep sleep is like. It's like that lamp. And when you rub it, <laughs> this, this thing comes out of it, these images which are a bit ghostly, just like this jinn which, jinni, which comes out of it. And they, these are the dreams. So out of these many little magic lamps that you have in your deep sleep, come out the different dreams and play out. But when you have not rubbed it, there is no genie to be seen. So they're all sleeping, they're all gone back into the lamp. And so, it's interesting to note that the state of transition that is between the state of deep sleep and dreaming consciousness is called Aladini. That's the name of this state of transition. So between Deep sleep and dream state is this transition state called Aladini. And it brings to mind this image of the magic lamp, Aladdin's lamp, and this image of this jinni coming out there and making your desires come true, which is what you exactly what you can do in your dream state. You can make all your desires come true. You can if you have a desire to be the world's richest man. You can do that in your dreams. Nobody's going to stop you. If you have the desire to be the world's most beautiful woman, become Miss Universe, you can do that in your dreams. Whatever desires you have are fulfilled in the dream state. So the dream state and the state of deep sleep are closely connected. Did you like the story of Aladdin's lamp? <laughs> yeah, I particularly like the story simply because when I first heard that this transition state was called Aladini, I was quite amused by it because I I realized how apt that name was, how perfect it was, how well it fitted. I can well imagine that a couple of thousand years ago, um, these, these stories, these fables or these stories were common in India and Arabia because India and Arabia were very close uh, historically and still are in fact. If you see the map and you see the coast, the western coast of India, the ports of Gujarat, uh, Mumbai, especially Gujarat, 
you can sort of get into a boat there and you go kind of just straight <laughs> and you're going to end up in, in Arabia. That's just the Arabian Sea right there on the western coast of India. So these historical connections have been existing over thousands of years. You can well imagine that people in India knew these stories or it's maybe even possible that the stories were originally Indian and then became common, uh, you know, commonly used uh, also in Arabia and then went around the world as Arabian Nights. For example, the numbers that we use today are called Arabic numerals. But the Arabic numerals actually came from India. Calculus, in mathematics, we talk about calculus, and calculus is or algebra. Algebra is uh, attributed to an Arabic uh, mathematician, uh, Al-Jabir or something. And algebra, that's where it comes from. But a lot of the mathematics that was in Arabia was actually coming from India because of very, very close trade connections and the fact that there was... Um, no uh, connection because of from Europe, direct connection to India because of the whole of Africa that was in between. So, uh, yeah, I can well imagine that the yogis came up with this, hmm, let's call this transition state Aladini. Yeah. Yes, Perry, I'm sure you remember it from your youth. Nice story. Fun story, uh, Vishal says in Oman, the locals speak Hindi or Urdu, I guess, because of the also a lot of uh, people from India work there in the Middle East, a lot of people also from Pakistan. And so it could be a, either Urdu or, of course, kind of Hindi. Many of the people in the Middle East still watch uh, Indian movies a lot, so they know it also from the language also from Indian movies. Yeah, so that was just a little fun uh, story, but a story which gives us the feel of how it is when you go into deep meditation and you start exploring the very seeds, the samskaras themselves. You begin to see this transition. And when you see the transition... If you see it directly in meditation, you will remember the story because you will see immediately the connection between Aladdin's magic lamp and what's happening in meditation. I suspect sometimes that the story of the magic lamp perhaps even came uh, from this meditative experience. Since many of these stories, mythologies as well as many of these ancient stories based on on meditative experiences and our symbolic stories. So the state, uh, sorry, we were at verse 76. In deep sleep, the mind remains in its dormant state because there's no alternation. While seeing an object during the waking state, the mind is absorbed also. That absorption is disturbed by the experience of another object the next moment. O Brahman, listen, I will explain this to you through my direct experience. Attempting to fathom the fa subtlety of this truth, even the learned ones become bewildered. That's a good line to note there. Attempting to fathom the subtlety of this truth, even the learned ones become bewildered. Who are the learned ones? Is referring to the Brahmins. This uh, text is a little bit um, irreverent, not very respectful towards the Brahmins, though in the social set up or the culture um, in India and other Hindu countries. Brahmins were always highly respected. They were custodians of ritual knowledge 
and of um, the scriptures. But this is a little bit irreverent, making kind of, you know, little um, sharp comments and says even the learned ones become bewildered because this is such subtle knowledge, you can only understand it with direct experience. You cannot understand it through just mere learning. And King Janaka says, I will explain through direct experience. I am not explaining you things from books that I have read, but this is my direct experience. And that's a great um, final authority, is direct experience of deep meditation. No scriptures of this depth will be understood by anyone who has not had direct experience. And one who has direct experience is able to explain these things in a very simple manner. Those who have no direct experience uh, like to believe that they know this, will explain the same thing in such a complicated manner that you will never understand it. But the ego likes to, to act learned. A question from Vishal, is this why Arjun used as a disciple in Gita because of direct experience? Yes, he's a warrior. He's not a Brahmin. A Brahmin, they will learn it. But warriors are symbolic of men of action. They are absolutely, you know, doing... Um, they are in the battlefield. And that's what we want to do. A battlefield as in the battlefield of meditation. You want to purify these negative thought patterns. And so this story that we are talking about right now, this scripture, Tripura Rahasya, is also a dialogue between a teacher and a student. And the student is a Brahmin, but he's a very unusual Brahmin because he's a Brahmin warrior. He fought and he is an absolute master of weapons such a great master of weapons that even the great warriors came to him to learn how to use these weapons. So he is a unique Brahman because he not only has book knowledge, he also has direct experience. He was willing to sit down and meditate. And that would be an ideal combination. An ideal combination where you have both. You have knowledge of scriptures but you also practice then you can explain these scriptures to others for example Raman Maharshi was a great sage you would say in symbolic terms he was a warrior but in symbolic terms if you would use Brahman he was not because he had no scriptural knowledge but still many Brahmins would go to him and ask him to explain the scriptures because the moment you told him something, he said, oh yeah, I know this from my own experience. I can validate that. So even though he had not studied any of these scriptures, he was the one who had this text, the Tripura Rahasya. He was the one who had this text translated from the original Sanskrit into English. The very first translation of Tripura Rahasya was overseen by Rahman, Raman Maharishi himself. Verse 78. Nirvikalp Samadhi, the highest state of Samadhi, deep sleep and seeing objects directly are all similar. All three are similar. Nirvikalp Samadhi, deep sleep and seeing objects directly. Those who practice and attain direct experience see the difference in those three kinds of experience. The differences are known to those who practice. So it's very nicely said here. Let's not discuss the differences between the three too much because these are so subtle. This, this difference is only known to one who has practiced and attained. In Samadhi, there is only pure consciousness. In deep sleep, consciousness remains dormant. 
diversity is seen in the waking state. But in Samadhi, only one absolute reality exists. So, they are explained, but the deeper understanding of this is only possible for those who practice. Because the differences between the three are very subtle. Throughout, self-illuminated Atman is one and the same. Always remains free from all afflictions. Therefore, it is said to be pure consciousness. Samadhi and deep sleep last for long periods. So, when a person comes out of those states, he remembers them. But the moment of perception is so brief that one does not have time to become familiar with this naturally arising state. If samadhi and deep sleep were as brief, these states would also remain unfamiliar. So, it's important to understand that when samadhi is brief, it would remain unfamiliar. In this text, we also talk about sleeping samadhi, uh, sorry, fleeting samadhis. These are experiences that a lot of us have had. But they were so fleeting, so transient, that you almost maybe didn't even notice them. And a lot of people have these experiences, but they are washed away because they don't really create a, a strong impact. You could have a wonderful experience of a fleeting samadhi when you walk along the ocean. You know, if you're at a beach or so and you see this vast ocean and you get the sense of infinity there, that would be a fleeting samadhi. You go uh, climb a hill and you're standing there on top of the hill and you see this amazing horizon, this expanse, this vast expanse in front of you. And perhaps you're lucky and you see the, it, it stops raining, the clouds pass, there's a little bit of sun and suddenly there's a fabulous rainbow in the sky and you have this feeling of intense beauty and joy and all the things come together and that just lasts for a few moments. And that would be a fleeting samadhi. But we forget about this. It doesn't have that earth-shaking impact on you. And so they remain unfamiliar. But when these states last longer, you don't forget it. And so when you come out of it, you still remember it. And that transforms you. So if the person, if this experience is very brief, like I mentioned, just a fleeting samadhi, this state would remain unfamiliar. You would not really, it would not be established enough to want you to really long for it. When it is very strong, very intense, or it lasts for a really longer period of time, then it will transform you. That will really have a, a major impact on your life. So maybe it's a good place to stop here. If anybody has any thoughts or questions before we end. I just wanted to repeat that uh, we will prob we will be moving out of the go to meeting platform, and the next um, sessions we will continue the Tripura Rahasya using this platform go to meeting, but it's very likely that we will discontinue with this platform after the end of the scripture. And we will move to uh, live stream broadcasting on Facebook as well as YouTube. For those of you who are on Facebook and are members of the uh, Life First Satsang group, which is a closed group uh, that's very nice and very convenient, we will be kept uh, abreast of the happenings. Some of you can check on the website 
if you're not a member of the group or don't want to be on Facebook, the live stream will also happen on YouTube. So you don't have to be a member of uh, Facebook if you don't want to. You can just watch the live stream on YouTube as well. But uh, we're still not quite there and that might take a bit of time. So I, I hope to get that worked out soon. So have a nice weekend everybody. And uh, see you next Saturday. Yes. Um, no, sorry, we are not seeing, uh, we are not having the session next Saturday. I just remembered next Saturday is um, the uh, Diwali season and there are some functions that I would like to attend. So next Saturday we will take a break and come back the Saturday after. So we're going to take a break uh, next Saturday because of the Hindu New Year, for those of you who don't know. And... Uh, so see you in two weeks. Bye-bye, everyone. And uh, Happy New Year and Happy Diwali to everybody in advance. <laughs> Thank you, Perry. We will. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Happy Diwali, everyone. Diwali, Festival of Lights. Have a nice time. Light in your lives.